couple of weeks ago, we celebrated um, the police, we've celebrated first responders, and today we're going to be celebrating those who have graduated high school or the academy, as well as college. We're celebrating it because they're about to start a life, a new beginning to their lives. can't get over the number of young people that we have here. I mean, I, it was, I was blown away a couple weeks ago when, when they had the, the, the young people's story, and I don't know, like half the church was up here. It's phenomenal. And so when I was asked to, 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 to talk today, am I like echoing? Um, when I was asked to give today's message, I thought, new beginnings, this is great. It's, it's almost like a commencement, which is on my bucket list. I'd, I'd love to do that someday. And so I thought of all these great uh, tit sermon titles, um, and then under the counsel of Pastor Mark, uh, he kind of directed me to the best one. One of them was going to be life's, uh, life's Not Fair, Get Over It. That was one. Um, no more trophies for showing up, so grow up. The other one is life is tough, but when you're tough on yourself, life gets a little bit easier. I'm thankful that Pastor Mark said, why don't you just stick with new beginnings? So I did. New beginnings. When we think of new beginnings um, and, and thinking of coming out of high school uh, and going to college, many of us remember those days. Um, uh, I, I know I shared with, with everybody here uh, what, uh, like a long time ago um, that during my, uh, right after I graduated from Shenandoah Valley Academy, I was all set to go to the Ohio State University and try out for the football team because I wanted to be a tight end, wide receiver. Um, but God had other plans for me because at the end of the summer, while I was working in the steel mill, I was involved in an explosion and, and lost my sight for about 24 to 36 hours. I was in the hospital with second degree chemical burns. And the one thing that I really, I just did not like it at all. I mean, I was angry. I was upset. I was like, why? Why? But then I realized that, hey, I don't want to go to a big university where there's a lot of strangers. And man, I, you know, I want to go where people are that I know share my same beliefs. And I know people. And so I ended up going to Columbia Union College, Washington Adventist University now. And being there with my friends as, you know, I healed over the course of several years was amazing. And while I was upset initially, I realized that God had different plans for me. Looking back, it's easy to say that, but at the time, it was very hard to understand. I mean, I praise God because if I didn't go to CUC, I would have never met my wonderful wife. And we wouldn't have had two amazing kids. New beginnings. New beginnings, though, as we saw this week, are not always great. I mean, when we think of new beginnings, we think happy thoughts. But new beginnings are not always rainbows, unicorns, and puppy dogs. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here today in your presence. And Lord, I ask that you put the words in my mouth and speak through me. In your name I ask, amen. Truth be told, I, I started writing this message about five or six weeks ago when Mark asked me if I would, you know, be willing to come in and do, do a mini commencement. And, and so I, I had everything written out. In fact, on Wednesday night, I was typing up a few more notes and I printed it out. And then Thursday, as I was on my way over here, I just started thinking about New beginnings isn't just about happy things. New beginnings is also about events that shape us and change us and have a negative impact on us. Which is why I changed the majority of the message today. And, um, and, and so for me, I really, I really want to go through this and show that in the Bible, there are so many new beginnings that we can draw hope from. But before we do that, I want to ask you guys, this is like a little pop quiz, um, how many of you consider yourself honest with integrity? Oh, come on! Are you serious? Okay. All right. We'll go with another question. How many of you honest people think that there is something that you can do today that would make your personal life professional life, and spiritual life a lot worse. 
okay, seriously, guys, come on. I'm sure that you can think of things that, I mean, yeah, even my wife, I know what you can do, right? How many of you think that there's something you can do today to make your life, personal life, spiritual life, and professional life a lot better? Okay. And how many of you think that the choice is yours? You have the choice to do that. Can I see your hands? Okay, so what everybody has said is, it doesn't matter what I did yesterday. It doesn't matter my failures yesterday. They don't define me. It's what I do today. You can't saw sawdust. We're going to go forward. It's what we do. And you said that the choice is yours, and I want you to keep that in mind as we move forward. New beginnings, I said, man, this is one slide that was really good because it's new, it's starting, it's excitement, it's hopeful, it's anticipation. Man, when we, going into college, man, I was just thinking about, oh, this is great. I'm going to meet someone. You, my parents are somewhere else. That's good, right? I get to drive a car. I'm, I'm my own person. Even when I went to Shenandoah Valley Academy, I had a car, but you couldn't take it off campus, so it was really no good. But it's New beginnings is like filled with hope. But then I also realized this past week that many new beginnings are just another hit. Instead of a start, it's an end. Instead of excitement, it's fear. Instead of anticipation, there's anxiety. And instead of hope, there's hopelessness. We see that. We see that when people, uh, or, or when, when kids go into schools and somebody some deranged person decides to go in and try to make a name for themselves. We see that, um, that, that frustration and hopelessness across society. And, and this became clear to me, especially with young people. Because young people are really, many of them are really feeling helpless and hopeless. And I, for me, I'm like, oh, it's all because, you know, now instead of bullying people and punching them in the nose, everybody's bullied online, right? And, and Derek set me straight on that. He says, no, you have no clue. And I said, okay. He's usually right. But he said, you know, there's a lot of pressure for grades. There's a lot of social pressure that, that I didn't have when I was growing up. Oh, you got to get into the right, you know, click or whatever. Not only that, but there's all this climate change. And then, well, there's wars, and oh, yeah, we've got grown-up leaders not acting properly. We've got people that, if, if you say the sky is blue, they'll say, no, it's, it's red. I mean, just, it doesn't really matter. People fight. People blame everybody else. And then, on top of that, with young people, they realize that if they go to college, they're going to come out with a lot of debt. Okay, we can't solve all these problems, but what I realized, my eyes were opened, that it isn't just one thing, it's a myriad of things. And when you combine that with the, what, what I like to term as the, the digital kids, where, um, you know, when, when we used to take pictures with the cameras and you, and you had to go and develop the film, if you took a bad picture, you still paid for it to be developed, right? The digital age kids, it's like, you know what? If I don't like that picture, I'm going to delete it. Uh, if I don't like you as a friend, I'm going to delete you as a friend. I'm going to defriend you, I think, is what you can do. Um, and, and any video games, whether they're, you know, war games, shoot them up, any video games. If you don't like where you are, you hit the reset button. There's no consequences. There's no consequences for doing something wrong. And then we encourage them and say, if you show up, you're going to get a you're going to get a trophy. So no wonder kids are crying out for attention when everybody gets a trophy for showing up. No wonder kids are crying out for help with all of this pressure. And all, most of us have different ideas as to how we can help them. I think that Charles Dickens said, when he wrote, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. You know, the Bible tells us that there's wars, rumors of wars. Um, parents are going to have fights. Things are going to happen. People are going to be divided. This has all been predicted, so it shouldn't be a shock. But what is a shock is to the magnitude and the swiftness that these things come on. Now, 
I don't want us to start thinking, oh, this is awful. I have, everybody's going to have to go on antidepressants after this, okay? No, because we as a church and as individuals and as followers of Christ, we need to offer hope to those in the world, especially our young children. I, I am so excited to know that Minnetonka Christian Academy is moving over to the big building. Are you kidding? The number of students, I was blown away that, that, are, that are coming in. It's exciting. It is an exciting time. And so for that, I, I like to start, I'd like to talk about, let's see, wait, where'd it go? You know, earlier today, I had problems. Ah, in the beginning. So I, I always like to have like a beginning and an end, you know? Um, and my wife says all TV shows are not going to give you a happy ending, it, uh, and I, I don't like to watch those. Um, but, but we like to have beginnings. And so it, the one thing I, I, I want to say right now and, and put a plug in for this is the Bible is the greatest book ever written greatest stories ever told. Did you know that it's the number one, I, you probably do, number one selling bestseller, over 5 billion copies in almost 3,500 languages that at least some of the Bible, if not all, have been translated into. Now, I understand there's like 7,500 languages, so we're about halfway there. This book has been on the top bestseller list, not just of all time, but according to to uh, a study that I saw, it was, it's been the number one selling book every year, and that study was done in 20, 20, uh, 2005. So up until then, it was number one, and you won't read about that in the New York Times. This is a bestseller, and I don't care what you like, but man, if you're into romance, have you ever written, writ, read Song of Solomon, Song of Songs? If you're into mystery, man, David had a lot of them, right? If you're, into, if you're into, you know what, on hard times, look at Job. In the beginning are the first three words of the number one best-selling book of all time. When we look at that number one best-selling book, we look at it as not just the best-selling, but the number one book for changing lives. Because those people who read it, really read it, not just memorize the verses, and take it to heart, are changed. Their lives are changed. So today, oh, and by the way, the number uh, two bestseller of all times is only a book that sold one billion copies. So far and away ahead. So today, we're going to look at some different examples in the Bible where people didn't let the negative events define them. They let them refine them. And I'm not going to go through all of these names because if, we w if I did, we would be here well past my late checkout time that I got at the hotel. But I'd like to highlight just a couple. Joseph, now, now Joseph is, is really one of my favorites, but Pastor Mark already stole that thunder about three weeks ago when he summed it up like this, and I wrote this down because I, I was, it was impressive. Joseph didn't become a great man when he was called by the king. He became second in command because he was the same person throughout his life in every stage as a child, as a slave, as a prisoner. I believe that when we teach our children right, they will grow up and be a delight, right? I believe that. And, and look, I, as a kid, as a pastor's kid, most people have an idea of how bad pastor's kids are. I can assure you, for three of my siblings, all the bad stuff, you, you can definitely take up with that. Me, I wasn't like that. Oh, sorry, Dottie, I guess you weren't either. Okay, sorry. Um, but, but, when you, but when you look at this, you look at kids growing up, and, and when I was, went to college and in my early 20s, I was, I'd been baptized, but I was nowhere near God. It wasn't because I didn't want to be. It was just, I was growing. I was growing. And thank God that I know my mom and dad 
were praying for me every day because over the years, I've drawn closer. As people change, so do their thoughts and the beliefs. So what I'd like to do is talk a few minutes about Jonah. And we all know the story of Jonah. God calls him. He says no, runs away, gets into the belly of a fish. Jonah apologizes, goes to Nineveh, and he is all set to tell people. So he is starting a new beginning, a new beginning of taking this message to, to Nineveh, and he's excited. You are going to die. <laughs> I'm just like, he hated Nineveh. You're going to die. I'm going to watch. Okay? He preached that day after day after day. And the countdown was on. And then Jonah goes up on a hill, and he's sitting there waiting to see God's handiwork of total destruction. And God didn't destroy the city. Why? Because the king says, we need to repent. We need to come back to Christ. We need to go back to our roots. And God spared them. Now, many people don't think about this because we don't know much about, or at least I don't, much about the Ninevites after that. But at that moment in time, when they accepted Christ, it was a new beginning for them. And how many of those people went on to be great. Jonah, at the same time, he was disappointed, but he also had a new beginning. Because when he complained about the fact that they weren't killed, and, oh, this, this tree that I sat under, it's been eaten by a worm, God set him straight and said, you didn't create the tree, why are you upset? And why are you upset about more so than about that than you are the fact that I saved all the people of Nineveh? So we can draw on instances of that, but the real draw, that the real kicker when I was going through this is looking at when bad events don't, don't define somebody is the story of Job. And any time I'm in a bad way, I start reading the book of Job because no matter what I'm going through, it is not what Job is going through. Imagine that. One day, in, in what he loves God, he's wealthy, he has uh, 10 kids, I think. He is loving life, living the dream, and loving God. And the next day, his family's gone, all of his wealth is gone, and his health is gone. Now, as parents, okay, we know, okay, financially, there's going to be some setbacks. We know our health, you know, is, is going is to have ups and downs. But with our kids, when we heard Connie up here praying with our kids, that's a whole different story. And what's amazing is that Jonah's, uh, Job's friends came over and had a pity party. He, they're like, oh man, you know what? It's because of this you did this. They wallowed in it. What impresses me is that Job, Job never said a bad word about God. He held his tongue. Friends, I got to tell you, in, in today's society where it's the, we live in the age of rage, people, if they feel wronged, they will immediately look to blame others, vent it on social media, and try to divide people. It's a fact. And if you don't believe it, just go on out there and look, because it is a fact. And yet here's Job losing everything that he loved, everything that he had worked hard for, no rhyme or reason, gone. But I love this story because it has a happy ending. He stayed strong. Even when his wife was saying, you know, you probably need to curse God. You just, look, this is over. He stayed strong. And coming out of that, he had 10 more kids, and he had more wealth than he ever started with. Man, when things are going bad, in my life, or in your life, or in the community. Look at Job. Study Job. And, and in the first service, I said, you know what? I don't care if you read the Bible through every year, and I know a lot of you do, and that's, that's awesome. What I find is that whatever part of my life, whatever stage I'm in, when I read the Bible, I draw something new out of that at that time. Because my life, I'm going through something different than what I was a year ago, than what I was two years ago. Job, 
is a great example. When we look at Paul, Paul was out killing Christians, and then God brought him, and Paul put that same energy into saving people. And Paul's words resonate with me. I die daily. All right. Now, when I'm thinking about this, I was on my way over here this week um, on Thursday driving, and, and I don't have a fancy car. It's a little Honda Insight, but man, I love a couple of features. One is the adaptive cruise control, so I don't have to keep pushing the brake. And the other is lane keep assist. Drives my wife nuts because she's like, how can you trust that, right? So, so I had that on, and, and I, my attention kind of got diverted sometimes with the computer that I had open, just, you know, happened from time to time, and the car would just go along. And then if I left my hands off the steering wheel for 10 seconds, I'd hear a little beep, a little light would flash. I'd be like, okay, touch it, go. I was so comfortable leaving my car to do the driving. The biggest challenge for me is trusting in God to do the driving in my life. When I wake up in the morning and I ask him, I say, I'm turning my life over to you. I'll help you. I'll be, I'll be anything you want me to do today. I will do. Use me in any way. And while I say that, there are some days that I have that little reservation. It's like, okay, don't ask me to do that. Don't ask me, to, oh, oh, let me, no. And yet here in a car with the technology still fairly new, I'm ready to go to sleep and take a nap. We need to have not just an attitude of gratitude, but an attitude of service. Jesus was the ultimate example for us. And when you study his life and you look during the first part of his life, he studied the Gospels. You know, we think, okay, Jesus was born, he was, he's the Savior. But he didn't know everything. When he was growing up, he was being taught just like all of the students today. You're being taught, and, and, and he realized, wow, okay, I am supposed to be this sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb. He didn't know how it was going to be done, but he knew that he was going to be the sacrificial lamb. And he set an example for all of us throughout his life. The first thing that I, that I really love is the fact that he got baptized before he started his service. Now... We say, um, John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So, you know, a lot of people just think, well, when he came, when he was born, he's automatically there, the beginning starts. No, it doesn't. Jesus didn't start his service until after he was baptized. And he was baptized so that people could see that he himself, who probably didn't need to get baptized, was declaring that his mission is officially starting. Angela, when I was here about a year ago, and you were baptized, it was so moving. I was, I was just, and, and, your, and your speech, and just watching, I think you and two or three other people were baptized. When our youth or when adults are baptized, they're taking a stand that says, God, I am taking a stand now for you. I may not always do things the right way. I may make some poor decisions, but I really want to dedicate my life to you. And as a church, as a community, we need to support every single child, especially those who know that they are trying to find their mission, looking for God. We need to encourage them and not discourage them by our actions. The second thing that Jesus did is he looked to take care of people's needs first before their spiritual needs. He, he looked at people, and he didn't go over and say, are you a Christian? Do you believe in me? If you don't, okay, never mind. He didn't say that. He didn't do that. Instead, he said, get up and walk. Take up your bed and walk. And people had to do something to be healed. If, if I told you, take up your bed and walk, and you have never walked, and you said, yeah, okay, right, I'm just going to sit here. People had to believe. So out of, out of Christ's works and his teachings, he not only healed people physically, he healed them emotionally. 
He healed them spiritually, and they, in turn, and, and in turn, we have been given a great commission. Christ in our lives, when we are willing to turn over our lives to him, he will create a whole new beginning, which gets back to Paul saying, I die daily. A lot of people look for new beginnings. You know, when, when it comes January 1, I'm going to start losing weight. I'm going to start saving money. I mean, friends, no matter what you say you're going to wait and do or do somewhere when you get there, when you, just remember, when you get there, there is where you are. And, and, and so why wait? Every day is a new beginning. If I wake up without dirt over my head and I go home at night and I haven't been locked out of the house, I am blessed. Just saying. We need to understand that it's not about prayer, lip service, or anything else. It is about being leaders in the church and being on fire for God and being on fire for encouraging each other. That brings me to my final point, that when we have people changing their memberships to come here and when we have people being baptized, I like to say membership has its privileges. Many of us are members of Costco, because we want to save money, especially now on gas. Many of us are members of Netflix, Hulu, all the different things, right? And we like it. We like it. Guess, what? Guess where the membership is really technically free? Is the church. I mean, yes, we need your offerings. There's no question. But the offerings are supposed to be out of thanks and giving thanks. What we do is we don't need you just to show up in the pew on Sabbath. We need you to help out within the church and to be leaders and to be strong and to hold people accountable for helping others. Too often I see this, and I've seen this in, in you know, other churches that I've been in, where it's only a select few that do everything. And, and, and now when we're trying to get people to come back into the church after covid it's not about just getting them here, but it's about fellowshipping. It's about lo looking each other in the eye and really saying, how was your week? And this past week was pretty tough. But we come here because we can share and we can give fellowship. We can give thanks to God and we can help each other deal with all of the challenges that we've had this week and help them prepare for next week. For the youth that are here, for the... Um, High school seniors and academy uh, graduates, as well as college graduates, we're going to be honoring you in just a couple of minutes. Um, and, and we have some wonderful parting gifts for you as well. Um, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, I've been at various conferences, and, um, and they usually give us really nice kind of like little tchotchkes. For instance, this one. This one is it used to say to it on it, and, and so uh, the conference I was at, it was at a Zig Ziglar conference, he said, we, you know, we have these because for all you guys out there, anytime you, know, you tell your wife you're, you'll get to it when you get around to it, you now have a round to it, so there's no excuse. The other one that I went through was a leadership training at, at ConAgra, and I really liked this, and I thought, well, maybe I'll just get some blank keys, but then I thought that's really not good for high school seniors. Or, you know. But they gave me this blank key, and they said, what you learn this key will open many doors. You, though, have to create it. You've got a blank key. For us today, we have a blank key. We talked earlier, we don't care what just happened yesterday. It's what we do today. It's how we move forward today and every day for the rest of our lives. We have a great commission. We have a charge. We have a great commission. Uh, okay, that's youth leadership. Yes, well, I think there was a... There. Whoop. There we go. Are you prepared to serve? Are you prepared to take your hands off the wheel of, uh, of your life and say, Jesus, take the wheel. Use me however you need me. He may send some of us to other places. He may have us do things here. He may have people provide the funding. It doesn't matter. Use me. Are you prepared to move forward? And the most important things when I look at this are taking the servant leadership, humble, kind, 
The attitude of gratitude, representative of God to the world, love, honor, and respect. When I say representative of God to the world, um, as many of you know, I'm a big John Maxwell fan. I, I joined the John Maxwell group several years ago. And so there, I've, I've done some executive coaching. I've done some training. Uh, I'm trying to do more. And I've done some speaking. But every time that I do something for the John Maxwell team, I put on a shirt that says John Maxwell. Maxwell Leadership. And, and many of you wear uniforms out there. And, and you're kind of proud of those. You're, you're pr it's like, I am not just myself, but I am representing something bigger than me. What is bigger than being a child of God? and putting on his robe of righteousness every day, not representing yourself, but representing God, Christ's love to the community. There's no room for divisiveness. We're not going to have uh, in heaven a Republican side, a Democrat side, and all. No, there's no room for divisiveness. And Christ even said, by your fruits, you will know them. Don't expect to plant... Uh, a, a tree of, with apples and expect to get prunes. T so today I'm actually going to call um, Pastor Mark up. Uh, I am going to say this. Uh, we're going to call up some, some students in, in just a minute. But the gifts that, that I want to make sure that um, all of the, that you get is um, are two books by my next to favorite author, uh, which is not Jesus or the Bible. But the two books are Sometimes You Win, Sometimes You Learn for Teens. Excellent book. In fact, I like some of this in here when he says, um, life is difficult. There are three things, three, uh, three realities of life. Life is difficult. Life is difficult for everyone. And life is more difficult for some than others, right? But then he doesn't leave off there. He says, don't make life harder for yourself. Keep growing and learning. Think, think, think. Find reality. Face reality. Be ready to adjust and take the best action. So this is the one uh, for teens. And then, because I'm so big into leadership, I, I, I absolutely love this. Um, and I have John Maxwell's Bible, like Leadership Bible, which pulls out little statements uh, and, and things in different chapters and books about the type of leadership, because he says, all the leadership things I know, I learned from the Bible. And John has published over 100 books so on leadership. But this is 21 Laws of Leadership in the Bible. And for our youth today, as you grow up, and as you look at some of the challenges you face, you want to become a great leader. You want to become somebody who can change someone else's life, or who might, who might have changed somebody else's life through your actions, then, that, then take that, read it. Because as this book says, change your world. One person can make a difference in the life of another, and then that person may make a difference in the life of hundreds. So, Pastor Mark, you want to bring people up? Uh, with Doug giving all these kinds of gifts that people have to pay. Um, and the names that have come back to the office uh, since our announcement last week are, uh, and, and if I call your name and you're here, please stand. Chulwe Hamankuli, Nate Zachman, Gracia Zachman, Yvette Integeye, Yvonne Integeye. And if you're also a high school graduate and you're here, please stand. And if you also just graduated from college, please stand, because you will be a re recipient of these very good gifts that uh, Doug has brought for you today. If not, come by the office. We will have it for you. But I just wanted to uh, take this time to recognize the hard work and the families who've continued to support their young people. We want to celebrate with you and let you know that here at Minnetonka Church, we are grateful for the young people that God blesses your family and has become part of our Minnetonka Church. And we want to make an impression in them that they don't have to be an adult. They're valuable now. With that, I'm going to transition to another part, if that's okay, Doug. Right um, I like stealing his thunder. Um, 
And I would like to call on Suzanne, uh, Robert, and Derek forward. I know I didn't tell you this, but if, if you're here, could you please come forward? And I'm just going to put you in the spot a little bit more. Um, this week, the Cross family uh, is celebrating. And this is a family who has been an integral part of Minnetonka Church. And they have been even before I was here. And it continued. This is a family who just keeps giving. And Rob, if you're going to be watching this later on, I want you to know I knew about it. Is Rob? No, Rob's not. Yeah. I don't know why you're laughing. Like, Rob. Oh. And um, I knew about it before Thursday, and I really wanted to be there. But I couldn't be, and so today I just wanted to take this time. Uh, Rob uh, was awarded the Firefighter of the of Year. year 2021. 2021. Yeah. These are proud. You want to say something a well, little bit more so, about that, so, please? Yeah, I mean, I got a call about six weeks ago from the fire department, and the, the lady left a message on my phone. And I naturally hit the panic button because anxiety and all that. I'm like, what happened? Um, but when I called her back, she, uh, she told us that Rob had been nominated for Firefighter of the Year and that he was going to win the award. And he didn't know he was going to win the award, he knew he, he was nominated. Um, and so I said, well, man, let us know. We'll, we'll be there. And, and we were official, we were going to be coming in here on Friday um, because of this today's message. Um, but I said, you know, we'll go, we'll go, we're going to go in there on Thursday because Thursday night was, was the ceremony. And so we stayed in the back. Uh, a couple of people were, were able to come. But, but uh, it was a surprise to him that he won. And it was a, probably a bigger surprise that we were there. And we came down. And um, yeah, I kind of lost it, but um, I'm proud. We're proud of our kids. We're, we're just proud. I, I want my boys, my kids to be, you know, wonderful. Yes. And thankful that the church represented. Oh, yes. And thankful that the church represented, came in. Um, because, yeah, we have multiple people, and we're just so thankful. And we're thankful for everybody's support um, for each other and for us. They are proud, and we are so proud as well. If you're a leader of the Generation Now ministry, I'd like you to please stand. If you're also a member and part of their young adult ministry, I'd like you to please stand because I want Rob to see that we support him and we're proud of him. Can you just please stand as I read these words, leaders and Generation Now members? Rob, our, firefight our new firefighter, congratulations. You represent folks who we lean on in times of crisis and when we need help and protection. You run toward danger for the sake of others in times of need and emergency. And with loved ones during stressful time are in need, you and folks like you are there. And so we offer this scripture and prayer for you. Scripture is found in Isaiah 41, 13. For I, the Lord your God, Hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Rob, this is my prayer for you, and I'd like to ask congregation to please close their eyes as well. Almighty God, you lend your strength to all those who are there for us in times of crisis, fear, and hurt. You give courage to the first responders like Rob, who continue to do this important work they are called to do looking beyond the risk for the sake of those who need your help and protection. We give you thanks for the many ways they give of themselves, their skills, their knowledge, and help in troubled times. Please protect them, O Lord. Extend your shielding hand over Rob and comfort his heart when they are called during times of need. We celebrate this great occasion for the Cross family as Rob completes the program, but also receives the award of Fireman of the Year. Give him hope and courage. Surround him with your love, your presence, and give him peace when he runs torn uncertainty and danger. Because we ask all of this in the precious and loving name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's put our hands together again for Rob.
So um, just in closing, thank you for coming today. I really would love to see more and more people coming back. This is an exciting time. Uh, it is a, a new day every day. And as we leave here today, please remember, it doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It's what we do today and moving forward because it is a new beginning.